I thought you meant the okay. thing that we get people to sign, like guess. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> you're gonna send me like a. She's an adult. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Send me some legal documents. Fax it it's over. Not a little child. Okay. Oh, how Three, we freak. Two, one. <laughs> that'll that'll do. That'll, that'll do. do. No. Alicia Johnson, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Good to yeah, see you. Yeah. yeah, it's been oh. a while. Oh yeah, and a lot has happened. Yes. Uh, for, for our <laughs> listenership, can you remind us what your uh, grad class year was? Uh, I graduated in 2018. Class of 2018. Yes, that is okay. not too long ago. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it's that long ago, but when you think about everything that's happened in the world. It kind of feels like a long time ago. It feels like, feels a lifetime. like this last like three months has been two years. Yeah. So. <laughs> but at For the sure. same time, but at the same time, it also kind of feels like it hasn't been a year at all. Like I kind of want to do over on this year. Yeah, when we're I, already halfway through, and the year's just starting. I know. When when we get back to my birthday next year, I'm just going to celebrate the same milestone again. <laughs> We have to re-celebrate everything. I mean, yeah. poor grads this year and just everything that's happened. Yeah, yeah my graduation has been pushed uh, twice. And now I don't even know if it's going to happen this year or not. Because so, they want it to be in person. Yeah, that's tricky. It's tricky. So after leaving the Hollywood Halls of Delview, what was next for you? Um. Well, I got accepted into my first choice college back in like the December before I graduated. So it was basically just kind of enjoy my summer before college. Um, and then it was just to kind of get into acting and start all of that up. And you and were at New Image. New Image College. Yeah. Um, and it's really weird because as soon as I started immediately, like a bunch of doors started opening for me for different paths I can go through. Um, I started modeling like, a couple months after I started college and everything. So now I'm with a modeling agency. I'm doing acting, uh, a lot of activism when I can, and then just kind of like working on the side. And your program was a two-year program? Yeah. I was supposed to graduate in September. Like this upcoming September? Yeah. September cool. of 2020. Where's New Image? It's downtown, um, like Granville and Nelson. Okay, and they, they specialize in, in performing arts or? It's a performing arts school, but uh, they have makeup programs, which is for film and TV, and then they have spa classes. So, like, uh, spa? Mas yeah, massages, nails, oh, okay. lash extensions, all that stuff, waxing. But they just recently announced that they're getting rid of it and they're just going to focus on film and TV stuff. Hmm. Last year at the PNE. New Image had a booth set up where you could go get a free 15-minute massage. Nice. Yeah, I was supposed to be uh, a part of that, but mm -hmm. they the planning went weird, and then my schedule didn't fit with it with how last minute they had asked me to. Um, but I did stop by there a few times to say hello to everyone. And to get a free 15-minute massage. No, no, I never <laughs> had time. I'd have to, it was, you have to sit and wait for like, an true. hour before you get a massage and yeah, it's like i could i could get one for free after class if i wanted to yeah and and when i was there i was wrangling my uh my kid so it was like yeah we got to get to super dogs so we don't have time to stop for a massage oh yeah super yeah. dogs love that yeah. yeah so it sounds like you've been pretty busy um you've been acting as well yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, smaller films, smaller production stuff, like helping with student films. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so excited because they were all going to be done for June because I did five with one company and they were all going to be done for June and we were going to watch them. They were they were going to rent out a theater at the Scotiabank Theater mm -hmm. oh, and wow. we were going to watch all of them like a premiere. And then as soon as editing started for about half of them, the shutdown happened and they weren't allowed to go back to their studio. No. And just this last month were they allowed to go back and finish editing. But they're obviously we're past June, so they're not ready. No. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I messaged them and I was like, uh, I just asked them for footage so I can yeah. put it on my reel and stuff. And they're yeah. like, honestly, we're not even done editing anything. Is there like, um, 
a streaming service that could be used to do like a premiere kind of like event bright or something along those lines? Um, I'm sure that they have a way to like live stream it if they mm. wanted to still kind of do that idea. And um, I don't know, they might be waiting until theaters open up and still do that because it's, um, it was uh, Burnaby North. So it's a high school and it's mm. an ACIT program. So they're doing college level classes with industry grade equipment. Like their cameras are more expensive than the cameras that I have at my film school. Wow. Yeah. And like it's the students write all the scripts and everything. So I did, I got casted in one of the films and then everyone came up to me after and asked as a favor for me to help them. And I was like, why not? Like sure. you guys are yeah. pretty cool. As much experience as you can get with good equipment, that's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And it's a lot to add on to my resume too, before I can uh, start doing bigger projects. hundred percent. The, the, the good thing about all of this, I mean, it's messed with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So if misery loves company, I mean, <laughs> we all went down some sort of weird hole into a different dimension. It seems like. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. God. COVID was like a glitch in the simulation. That's how yeah. the first month felt. Yeah. Where's, where's Neo, right? <laughs> have you been dealing with it okay i mean it seems like you have some routines with work and everything back starting yeah. again so the first month was so hard i had to leave i had to move out for the first week of it i was supposed to leave for two weeks just for mm -hmm. my parents health and safety and mine as well um fortunately enough my best friend uh her and her mother are so sweet they immediately, like I called her mom, like crying, telling her I had to find somewhere else to live for a bit. And she was like, "Here, I'll pick you up tomorrow, pack your stuff. So I stayed there for the first week uh, and then I came home and then it was a month of just like go from the bed to the back deck, to the kitchen, back to the bed. <laughs> like I was, it was tough. And um, I stopped talking to like everyone because there was just nothing going on and there's nothing to talk about. And then eventually my work opened up and it was, uh, I was able to get into a routine again and work as much as possible. So I'm now busy enough that I'm not falling back into that hole of like, I have nothing to do except just lay here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I realized early on is that routine is so important when you when it comes to stuff like this like yeah. as soon as you can get something going like even just getting out of bed every day and saying okay i'm gonna take a walk or, or whatever it is it's just it was just so, so helpful yeah for for me it was like really important to not stay in my pajamas all day right like that was one thing that uh was hard on my mom was yeah. she she's working from home now so she, and she's like she's super at risk. So even me going back to work was a little iffy mm -hmm. and it's, it was just like reminding her like, Hey, you got to go get changed. Now you can't sit at your computer all day in your pajamas. Mm -hmm. You got to feel like some sort of normality here. But like in, in March, I definitely remember like the highlight of the day was going for a walk around the block with my kids and wife. <laughs> It's sanity just, walk. That's what I called it. Yeah, I, I we would do that. a sanity walk, and then my kids we were we would play a game called um, Watch for Zombies, and then it just like anybody that was walking down the block, we would try to avoid them. Oh my god, <laughs> so, that's a good way to teach your kids social distancing. Though oh, it totally was. It was a it was a fun game. Um, yeah. So yeah, we had to work it out and then the, the most recent thing for us was uh, extending our bubble to like family mm -hmm. so you know where we went over for dinner at my parents and that started feeling normal because we were you you everybody gets a little bit paranoid with this kind of stuff right every time i go to a grocery store i'm nervous or every time i leave my car i'm nervous so to to, to have that was really, really nice because um, um, we hadn't seen them for a long time. Yeah. Well, it was especially hard because I, with everything going on right now in the States and in Canada as well, there's so much that I was like, 
I wanted to go and I wanted to be a part of, but at the same time, it's just like, it's so hard on my parents, Mm -hmm. me going to the black lives matter protests, me going to the indigenous rights protests and going to the tent city and protesting for homeless rights. And I'm just around so many people. And it was hard because I just, I had to be there and I, I had to go and protest in person. But at the same time, it was just like, I'm bringing all of this home as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the good thing about how protests have adapted in Vancouver right now is um, you're not allowed into a protest unless you have a mask. And they, there's usually only like one or two entrances. Even when it's outside, it's usually in like a plaza where there's only a couple ways to get in. And they always have volunteers with like a bunch of masks just handing them out for free if you don't have one or if you need a better one. Um, and there was one protest that I went to where like every hour they were like, we're going to do the social distance dance. So everyone had to stick our arms out and move all the way around. And if you wow. were touching someone, you had to move. That's great. I That's think hilarious. overall, like we've been really good here. I, I have to say, I mean, there's people breaking rules everywhere, but, yeah. um, but here for the most part, I've gone on hikes. I've gone to places where it's, even though it's quite populated, people are pretty respectful of each other. So mm-hmm. I think it's been, that's why I think we've been gradually flattening the curve. Um, so it's good to hear about the the protest stuff and there have been no cases from from the protests. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were like, you're going to get COVID if you go to these protests. There, We're going to spike because of the protests. And it's like, okay, we're going to get a spike because some people just don't care and they don't mm-hmm. want to believe that this is real. Like in the States, there's the numbers are so high and they keep growing and growing. And it's not because of the protests. It's because nobody cares about anyone's health and safety there. Um, while we're on the, that subject, I'm going to share this image with you because I think it's funny and it's very on topic and it kind of talks about, um, what Mr. Kung was saying. Um, this was sent to me by a buddy, any zombie that does or any zombie movie that doesn't have hordes of people running towards the zombies to get deliberately bitten because they're convinced it's a liberal hoax. is going to look pretty unrealistic now. And I thought, mm-hmm. I thought that was really oh funny because it's God. true, right? Like in, in the States, there are people that unfortunately believe that it's a, it's a liberal hoax. And to me, that is just so strange. Like it's a virus. It doesn't see party lines. This is not a partisan issue. This is a pandemic that will kill everybody if it can, not just Democrats or Republicans, like everybody. And it just, it, it boggles my mind that there are people who believe that this is a liberal hoax. Well, it's almost like it's the the perfectly wrong time to have a pandemic going on in the states right now. The the you know the way they are at the moment, right? Yeah, um, it's so divisive. There, there, there are two definite sides, and there are people who just don't believe any of it. And you've got your conspiracy theorists, and you've got anti vaxxers and you know even when they come out with a vaccine. Who knows if it's going to improve? Well, I mean, you say that this is absolutely the wrong time for the states. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is the right time. Maybe this is exactly what the states needs in order to see this systemic change. Like, um, to me, it's it's kind of no coincidence that we're seeing this Black Lives Matter resurgence because it never really went away, but it kind of got quiet for a little while um, because the issues never went away. But but you know, after the death of George Floyd. Black Lives Matter is all of a sudden really right back in the mainstream where it should be until there's systemic change. But it's like to have it happen in the midst of a pandemic, it it kind of, it almost seems appropriate. Like we did this before. We had a Black Lives Matter movement and nobody was listening to us. Now there's a pandemic. Will you listen now? Yeah, there's so much that I can say about that. I actually, there's a question that I get asked quite a bit about um, my activism when I do like interviews about it and everything. And it's, um, you know, why did people, why did this get so big now? And it's because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Nobody's at work. Nobody's at school and everyone's on their phones. So everyone saw it like as soon as it happened, because in the States, Black people are, they're getting murdered constantly. They're being lynched. 
They're being murdered. They're being kidnapped. Everything. It's always happened. And it's still happening now to like this day, even after George Floyd. Bernoa Taylor was murdered over 100 days ago. And only one of the officers who killed her was fired. Not even charged yet. Yeah. Yeah. And if that happened in the middle of a pandemic, I, I would bet like my life that there would have been just as many riots because so many people would have seen it as it was happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All it's eyes were on, on yeah. what was going on. So um, there's an article that my, uh, my wife's uncle sent me and it, the article is called how freedom became free dumb in America. Is that Actually, the one you sent me last night? That's the one I sent you last night. Yeah. And, um, let me just read this uh, last paragraph to you, if you don't mind. It says, freedom, here I am, the American idiot, carrying my gun to Starbucks before I go to Walmart, where I'll choose between a million different flavors of the everyday low price, and then I'll dream about being great again while I drive my big car down the big empty highway, listening to some bellowing moolah of capital and individualism and cruelty, telling me to hate and rage a little more. Along the way, so what if I create my very own exploitation, abuse, misery, decline into poverty, despair, degradation, dehumanization? Hey, don't tell me any different. Isn't that what freedom really is? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think think what we're seeing is a culmination of, you know, like what America and American culture is really about is more focused on being self-serving and capitalistic and money and power um, and uh, more about the individual in terms of their philosophy and their, their overall um, way of life. Um, it, you can see all of that. Right. Um, and our, like in, in some ways uh, we're better, but in some ways uh, there are cases up here where it shows us that uh, there are some people here who are no different. And the problem with just kind of like that whole thing is Canadians are constantly comparing themselves to America to make us feel better. And we need to stop that because Canada is just as racist equally as racist. So many people of color are being stopped by police for no reason, murdered by police, taken off of their land. But the Canadians are so good at hiding it. There is so many, like in America, it's, it's always, um, black people who are being targeted in the, uh, in Canada here, it's indigenous people constantly. The police don't care. Yeah, there's to say that Canada is bereft of systemic racism would be a, a fallacy. It it exists here. It absolutely exists here, um, and we have a long way to go towards fixing it. That's for sure. Um, I just my hope, and maybe this is blind optimism, is that while I I absolutely one hundred percent don't think we're there yet, I want to believe that we're a few further steps down the highway towards being better than what we're seeing in American media that's being fed to us all the time. So when I talk about Canada, I don't think that we're innocent. I just think that maybe we're two or three steps ahead, hopefully. Yeah. And and, and at least moving in the right direction, not just, okay, well, we're better. So we're done. No, no, we're not done. We're, we have to keep moving. Yeah, there, there's no done. Yeah, nothing is like no. justice has not been served yet. Not, not everyone is equal. As, as a white person, I am above other people just because of the color of their skin. So there is no like we aren't even close to being there. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is it's it's such a hard fight to fight, and it's so long, and it's gonna take years, but we still, there's still somewhere to start. And a lot of people, how they see something like that, where it's like, well, we're not going to get it right away. It's not something we can get overnight. Yeah, like, don't, okay, don't, don't be discouraged by that. You still got to start somewhere. Yeah. Right. It's like kids going into kindergarten. It's going to be a long 12 years. So why even bother? 
So I think exactly. <laughs> just want to ask you, Alicia, what do you think? What do you think uh, would make you happy in terms of what goes on in the next few years or the next decade in terms of systemic change? I don't think I will be happy until everyone is equal. There is so much just like blind racism that is ingrained into everyone's brains just because of how Canada is and how just people are in general. I had to unlearn a lot of racist views because society like it's just the way that society is is it's there's always a certain way that they speak about a certain race or you know uh sexism and everything as well and it like nobody wants to unlearn that really because it's just it's it's a lot of work and it took me a long time to figure it out I'm still learning some things and I don't think I'll ever be happy until everyone is equal and that equality means giving the land back to indigenous people. That means getting justice for everyone who's been wronged by the government and the police system. That that would be defunding the police, you know, abolishing the RCMP and, you know, working towards a better future. I won't be happy until I see everyone wanting to fight this fight because I, I have cut out so many people who I called my friends that I talked to so often just because they refused to speak out about Black Lives Matter and they refused to acknowledge the problems that are happening. They refused to have any kind of conversation with anyone because mm. of their own kind of blind... They're, they're blind to what their privilege is. Mm. Let, let me ask you then, and I, I say this incredibly tongue firmly planted in cheek, um, when Mr. Kung and I teach innovation, one of the things that we love doing is we love bringing in the opinion of the devil's advocate. And um, Mr. Kung actually looked up the origin of the term devil's advocate. Um, and it goes all the way back to the Catholic Church. When they were selecting a new pope, you would always pick one of the priests to argue against why someone shouldn't be a pope. Because how can you know if something is the right decision until you've looked at all angles of a problem. Um, so to play devil's advocate, and I'm not saying I disagree with you, but again, just to play devil's advocate, um, let's say that you didn't cut those people out of your lives. What, what can people do to help educate these people that, and, and, and I understand exactly where you're coming from because I've met these people in my life too, people that refuse to listen. Like, is there a good way to somehow communicate with people that refuse to change rather than just erasing them and, and writing them off. Is there something that we can do better? Everybody, not just us three, but is there something that we can do better to try and bring those people back into the conversation? There is, but it's also a lot of on that person because mm -hmm. for me, I just want pe like people that I want in my life. I want positivity. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to see the change that has to be made, if you're, if you don't understand what's going on and you're not, if you don't think about what happened to every person who was found hanging in a tree because they were lynched by the KKK in America. And that doesn't make you mad. Like there's obviously something wrong. And it's just, if the, if somebody is willing to understand and educate themselves, then I will give them the resources to help educate themselves. I will help to provide knowledge to them and everything. And then that's when I can start kind of accepting them as a friend again. Mm -hmm. But to be completely honest, if you don't care about somebody's life just because they're a person of color, that's that's just racism. That's textbook racism. And I don't want that in my life. Oh, no, fair enough. And, and I completely agree with you that we need to surround ourselves with people that bring us up and make us better. And we don't need people in our lives that are going to bring us down. Um, the, the struggle that I'm having personally, the reason why I asked the question is because I, 
and, and, and few, there are few, but, but there are people that I come across from time to time that are very closed thinkers. And it's, it, it's hard to communicate with those people. It's, it's hard even with evidence and, and facts and reasoning. It's hard to communicate with those people. I have a and, hard time with that too. Like, yeah. Like you try to, like you said, use reason, use evidence, yeah. even, even try to understand empathetically what they must be going through, where they are coming from. But sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah. There's just some people who don't care. And that's, it, it's heartbreaking. It's sad. It is. I have family who just, yeah. I, I had family message me after I started posting on Facebook about Black Lives Matter and getting justice and the importance of the riots that are happening. I had a family member like reach out to me and tell me that I was wrong for thinking that way and that I, he doesn't agree with me and, and all this. And I, I gave him a couple chances. There were a lot of I I've known that he was a racist family member and he is sexist and homophobic, but I was like, it's my family. I can just ignore it. But it just got to the point there where it's like, I gave you chances. Mm. I'm, I'm using these posts as a form of education for people who are like you, who are closed minded, who don't care this and that. And you still choose to think this way. And so for that, like, I know you're my family, but I guess I'll just see you once a year at Christmas, and that's all that's going to happen. Not, not to say that I'm defeatist, but for me, that's the hardest thing to wrap my head around is like, if we want to see change, it needs to be holistic change. And it's going to be really, really hard to get to holistic change unless we have everybody on board. And then there, are, then you think about those people that you can just like in your mind, you can just imagine that person's never going to be on board. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do? It to, is to get that person or those people because it, this this has to be everybody. We have to be all in on this. Um. So that's where I think I get the most frustrated. I if if I hear someone make a racist comment, it upsets me. But I feel like, you know, maybe we can talk it out or maybe we can, uh, we can do some learning and, and we can fix this problem. But it's those people that present themselves as unfixable or unwilling to learn that devastate me the most. Yeah. And it is, it does get really hard. And, mm-hmm. and a whole, a huge part of activism is facing these hardships and like you're never it's never going to be one easy path there's so many obstacles that you have to jump over and some are they seem impossible and some seem so easy and that's probably one of the ones that are just they're just so difficult and you have to kind of step back and think like I'm gonna make the change that I can make I'm gonna do what I can do to make everything better in my life, uh, how I can. And if this person doesn't agree with that, then they can, they can be in their own bubble because at the end of this, I have a feeling that at the end of 2020, there's going to be so many changes. There's so much change that happened in America alone within like two months, um, one month, even after George Floyd's death. And it's just understanding like a lot of people are going to change their mind. They're going to understand that they are outnumbered and that people just don't agree with them. And they're going to think, oh, maybe I should kind of see what this is about. Mm -hmm. And then they'll educate themselves. And if they care, then they'll change their mind and they're willing to change. There are people in the States who were so insanely racist, but they took this time to educate and immediately change their views. Mm-hmm. There's like yeah, that I one think... popular photo of the protester who's like, sorry, I'm late to the party. I had a lot of learning to do. <sighs> yeah. That's a, that's a great sign. That's a great sign. 
Yeah, I think in some cases you just have to you just have to wait it out with people because they, I mean, xenophobia and and all of that is and all that hate is not something that you're born with. No, no, no. Yeah, right? hate is learned. It is something that you're you've learned uh, yeah. from whatever you're, you've experienced. Maybe these people have gone through hardships where it involved the other race or or whatever, um, and it's hard to undo because as as human beings we we are survivors and uh if we feel that we're wronged in some way then we make these patterns up in our head and unfortunately some of that might include race or how different a, a person is and so it's hard to how hard to undo that sometimes and but hopefully um like you mentioned with these people who are finally coming around after giving it some thought hopefully some of these people um do open up and start mm. being a bit more empathetic or seeing the other side or, you know, and, and coming around to, to realize what, what they're wrong about. Last summer, um, before my second daughter was born, um, it was like my, my summer to be with Kyla. My wife wasn't on mat leave yet. And it was just Kyla and, and I, and we went to a bunch of different playgrounds. Like that was kind of our thing that we did is we do little day trips and then we'd find ourselves at a playground somewhere. And um, I posted this on Facebook and it, it wasn't my quote. It was actually a quote from another dad that I came across at the playground. Um, but it was, it was such a cool thing to see that there were all these kids at the playground from, and, and like the, the very diverse group of kids at this playground were just all ha- having fun, getting along, playing and, and no fights or no nothing. And this dad walked up to me with like a, a kind of like a cheeky grin on his face. And he said, all you have to do is spend five minutes at a playground watching kids playing to remind yourself how absolutely ridiculous racism is because the kids don't see it. They don't. Like, oh, there's, there's another kid. I want to play with that kid. Yeah. Let's play together. Right. And it's just like, that's beautiful. Why, why can't we all just see things through the lens of a child? Right. Um, when I was younger, I remember, trying to be as anti-racist as possible. And I think it was probably when I was in grade 12, I used to, I used to say to people, I don't see color. I just see people. And, and I, I realize now the, the error in that quote, because when you say something like that, you actually deny a person their history and their cultural background. So now I, I like to say the opposite. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I do see color and I celebrate that. Like everybody has a story to tell. And if you're African and you're black, cool that's awesome. Let's, let's celebrate that. If you're Chinese, I I see you as a Chinese person or, or a Chinese Canadian. And I say, that's awesome. You, you have something cultural in your history that's worth celebrating. Let's hang on to that and let's celebrate that and let's celebrate you for who you are. So I like, I love seeing diversity. I love seeing kids play together and, and just celebrating what everyone has to bring to the table to make the world that we're living in. We have to. We have to celebrate that. We definitely do. Alicia, what brought us to, together today is, um, is because of your activism. And um, I just before we get into the specific story, um, I just want to kind of go back to maybe high school, or even earlier. Like, where does this come from? Like, your because I remember even in high school, you being really good at social media. I remember that time that uh, I believe uh, was a global that had thanks for giving. And I remember you being out there. Um, I don't know what you were doing, but somebody was whispering in my ear about, Oh, Alicia's on Twitter or, or <laughs> something like that um, going on and on about uh, thanks for giving and how they stole it from us. Yeah. Which from- I, I called him out real hard. <laughs> So where does this come from? This um, this need to speak out uh, or stand up for other people because I saw it in the drama room a few times as well uh, in, in in school. Um, you seem to be the type of person who would stand up for other people for sure. You would have people's back. Yeah, and uh, a lot of it is because I have so many friends who are people of color and because of that, I've seen firsthand the racism they have to deal with. One of my closest friends that I made because she started going to Delview in grade eight, same as me, she moved to uh, Missouri 
And when she came back to visit and everything, we were hanging out downtown and some homeless man came up to us and called her a hard R N word and then walked off for literally no reason. And see, like she has to go through that and like her whole life. And that's just the one time that I saw. And when you, when you see the discrimination firsthand, it's a little bit different than hearing it and knowing that it happens. And it was just a realization moment of like, this happens to people and this is so real. And, and this, this can't like this, my friends are hurting because of it. Like, um, even in Del Vue, there's, there's a lot of racism in Del Vue, especially with, um, with you and Mr. Choi, a lot of people will mix you up just because you're both Asian teachers. <laughs> and it's like, you, you laugh now, but it, it, it mm-hmm. it's sad and it's upsetting. Uh, well, Alicia, at least to me. In this past year in Innovation 10, someone called me Mr. Kung. So, so sometimes I don't think it's a race issue. Sometimes I think it's a uh, not paying attention <laughs> issue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, get, I get what you're saying, but like, like some, sometimes uh, I, I have been called and, and again, I'm not trying to take anything away from the weight of what you're saying, but there was one time that a student on multiple occasions has referred to me as Mr. Ursulak. Right and I've never, I, I've heard wonderful things, but I've never met Mr. Ursulak. Our time at Delview did not at all overlap. Um, you know what? I see it. Do you? Yeah. I see it. I've never met him. <laughs> I see I, it. I, I've heard nothing but good things. So I'm, I'm sure he's a wonderful guy. Um, and I, I don't take offense to being called Mr. Ursulak, but I just think it's really funny that like some, sometimes students just aren't paying attention. Well, like, I, I don't take offense either, but uh, I think it's a good question to ask as to, as to why, why the mix up. And I, <laughs> I don't think people are, necessarily being over, overtly racist it may be difficult to tell us apart maybe that's because they haven't been exposed as much to different types of people could mm-hmm. be like i i remember going on um a, a trip once to uh where was it to to toronto and it was like a leadership group with, with people from all over canada different provinces and i met this guy from newfoundland and uh we were in a dormitory together and uh, it was me, uh, a, a Muslim kid, and uh, some guy from Nova Scotia, and the the Newfoundlander. I was going to call him Newfie, but I, I know that's not what you call Newfoundlander. Oh, I, I know people from Newfoundland who refer to themselves as Newfies. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, he told me, "You're the first non-white person I've ever met." <laughs> I'm like, "What?" I don't know what part of Newfoundland he comes from, but that was so surprising to me. But he was, was this? it was such a revelation. I mean, he was really friendly and everything, but it was such a revelation for him, like to see other races. Which is crazy because of how diverse like Canada is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not trying to say that Vancouver isn't racist. I'm not trying to absolve Vancouver of any wrongdoing, but I think we're kind of fortunate um, where we live, that we have the opportunity to learn so much from each other because we have a great amount of diversity within our city. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I'm not talking about Vancouver proper. I'm talking about the entire like Metro Vancouver area. Um, and, and it is true when they say that birds of a feather flock together. Like when you look at immigration patterns, you find that people of like culture will congregate together. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that we have a large Indo-Canadian community in North Delta that's kind of its own community. And then, you know, I know that there's a lot of jokes that get made, but there's a, a large Chinese community in Richmond. Um, but it, it even goes back to, to European settlement. And I'm not talking about colonialism. I'm talking about immigration in the early 20th century. But like you can find different neighborhoods of Vancouver, like Commercial Drive, that's a, a large Italian community. And um, just, just outside of Strathcona, there's a large Russian and Eastern European community. Um, we're fortunate. We're fortunate where we are um, that we have that, that we have a lot of people from a lot of different corners of the world because there are places that are 
you, you know, further inland that, and, and there are communities in Canada that aren't very diverse. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm kind of saying is that I think the more exposure people have to different cultures and races, the more they're able to work with each other, mm -hmm. um, the, the less xenophobic they become in mm -hmm. my experience. And I really hate these clumpings of people who are homogenous, um, whether it be, uh, uh, I don't know, like some private schools where it's you know, only males and only females. I, I kind of don't like that idea, not for my kids anyway, because it's good to have exposure and work with people of different ethnicities and backgrounds and cultures, because that, that makes, in the, the, in the end, um, when you become an adult, you, some of this stuff you carry on with you. Like I've worked with these people before. They're okay. They're just like us. Right. So. Yeah. yeah but, um, going back to like racism in the school, uh, there was somebody who used to work at Delview who was very racist towards the Brown community. Um, that the, the, which was a majority at Delview. Um, and I had a lot of people of color who came up to me and they're like, this, this person always freaks out at me for walking in the halls and they, they think I'm skipping class, blah, blah, blah. And then they see some white person who's actually skipping class and they don't do anything. Wow. And I've had them, I, I had them come up to me. I was like, um, I was walking into class late and they were like, Hey, how are you doing? Just make sure you get to class. And then like, not even, not even before the end of the day, like the next period or something, I was walking to the bathroom and there was a person of color who was walking to class late. And the same staff member was like, you better get to class. Like you better not be skipping and freaking out on them. Mm. And it's, I've had so many people of color at Delvey who would come up to me and be like, this staff member is so insanely racist and I don't understand why nobody like notices. And it also has a lot to do with like nothing against you guys, but it has a lot to do with just the staff at Delview. Everyone's so close. You guys are all, are all friends or you appreciate each other so much that it's just as soon as we're like, there's a problem with this person. I I've had teachers like I've gone to a teacher because of a problem with another teacher and they've been like, no, like that's just, I'm friends with them. They're not like that to me. Don't even worry. Like I, I wouldn't look into it. And it was like dealing with that. And so the students, we kind of had to band together to protect each other because there were times where at school people felt unsafe because of the faculty. And even at my elementary school, it was so insane. It was like, we were grade seven, so 11, 12 years old. And the teachers thought that all the brown kids were forming a gang. And I was the only white person who stood up and went, I don't know what you guys are talking about. We're kids and these are nice people. We were in a meeting for about four hours and I eventually was like, I don't know wh where this is coming from. And after I kind of said that, they were like, okay, well, I guess this is over then. I'm I'm sorry I I laughed at that because when when you said we're kids I just had this image in my head of like kindergartners doing a reenactment of West Side Story <laughs> just like sitting there on the playground <laughs> <laughs> when you're a jet it is like but no no you're right you're right like I think it's also like we don't talk about it a lot yeah and if we did maybe we would start asking questions about ourselves and our behavior do you know what I mean like you have to. Yeah, because There's, if you if you don't realize it yourself, sometimes some people just don't realize it themselves, like what they're doing or how they're biased. And well, so and, to be open to talking about that specifically, yeah. maybe they start questioning that. And, right? and I think I think that's where a lot of um, a lot of people are criticized, and and a lot of people are. I don't want to use the word blamed. I can't, I can't think of a better word, but are, are, you know, I'll, I'll say blamed for experiencing white privilege. And they're like, but I, but I'm not racist. I don't do this and I don't do that. And I don't slander. And I, but part of white privilege, and, and this is what I'm coming to terms with my, with my own life is part of white privilege is not noticing. 
And, you know, uh, you were in grade 10 when I started. And I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to, to name the, the faculty member, but there's a good chance that uh, I was there at the time. And it's not for any prejudiced reason, but I may not have just not even noticed well, not, um, not for any malicious reason, but just because of, of my upbringing and, and coming to terms with that, you know? Yeah, no, this, that specific one, the racism with that one specific faculty member, students were, they had always said like, I don't want to go to a teacher about this because they, they just didn't want. Yeah. yeah but I'm, but I'm saying like even the stuff in the hallway, like mm-hmm. I, I wonder if I would have even been in the hallway and just not even noticed. Mm-hmm. For, for whatever reason right and like it makes me question my actions and my my privilege and that's important is yeah. taking the time to, to understand your white privilege yeah. I have had so many people come to me and been like you're using your white privilege the right way mm. and I've like I've had two people that I've, I don't talk to anymore be like I use you as an example when I'm to support an argument uh, about white, um, white privilege and how to be a proper white ally. And it's because I took the time like a years ago to be like, I experience life differently as a white woman. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of privilege and I have a lot of stuff that I don't have to fight for. Mm -hmm. And my friends who are, smarter than me, do better in school than me, have have better home life than me, just because their skin is darker, they have to fight so much harder than I do. And I had to spend that time to kind of think like, how can I use this to help them? Mm. And um, even now, sometimes I'm just like, I'm not doing enough. Mm-hmm. As as a white ally, I should be out there. I should be fighting. I should be this and that. Like I was, I was a human shield at one of the Black Lives Matter protests because there was a Nazi following us around. I was with two of my two friends that were people of color, and immediately we noticed somebody was following us, and I had to be like, get in front of me because they're not going to touch me. Wow. So, I'm just wondering, has there been a time when you? I'm just trying to poke and prod in terms of (laughs) figuring out where you come from um, and why you are so active right now. But was there a time when you, you didn't speak up for somebody or felt you should have done more, um, which kind of drives your ability to, to see the other side and want to fight for other people right now? Yeah. A lot of my growing, even now, but a lot of like growing up and through my teen years when I first started kind of um, getting into activism and when I first started learning how disgusting Canada is as a country and everything that's going on, I I just kind of started with conversations with adults and like, how, what do I do? How does this, whatever. And it's, The one thing, and I still get told this to this day, the one thing I've heard the most was, you're just a teenager. (laughs) Or they're like, you're you're just a kid. Like I, there's so many times where they're like, how old are you? You're 19 and I'm 40 something. I've experienced life so I know more than you. And it's like, no, you haven't sat down and done the research and it shows. Like doesn't matter how young I am. It is accessible to me to do the research, to see what's going on and see how to change it. But when you're a young teenager, you can't go out and do so much stuff. So you have to do that, that activism in the drama room. You have to do, you have to call out global TV on Twitter (laughs) for stealing your high school's charity. Like that's all I could do as a teenager guaranteed if all that stuff started happening now i would have rioted in the streets <laughs> like both i can mr. tell you a lot of adults don't know what to do no of course and and mr kung and i we we laugh when you said oh you're just a teenager because i mean you're kind of preaching to the choir here we're high school teachers we 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 understand and believe in the power of youth um i had somebody reach out to me from nova scotia who was a teacher who asked to teach their class add me 
into their curriculum for how we can use our voices as teenagers to make a change in the world. There you go. Are you going to do it? Yeah, I told him. Yeah. I was like, put it in there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's, let's get to why we're here then (laughs) or what brought us here anyway. Um, I saw you while I was browsing around YouTube, uh, not having anything else to do. And I saw this, uh, the special on, uh, the Colbert show late show, um, where they were, um, featuring the Tulsa incident, which I had already heard about. Um, and then they did this whole Oklahoma musical with uh, changed lyrics, which was very well done. And yeah, then well done. somebody, when they mentioned TikTok users, somebody appeared on my screen and I, I looked and I was like, does that, that looks like, there's no way. I almost didn't check, but I paused and I went back and it had your name up there. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so... That's so when I the- got you on Instagram right away, and then uh, you had you didn't reply. I think you heard from Turpin first because I told yeah. Turpin uh, right after that, and I, and, and I I just texted you right away. I was like, w- "Were you on the Colbert show?" <laughs> yeah, you messaged me, and I was like, "Hold up, what's going on?" And I you sent me the link, and I immediately started watching, and I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> and that's when I saw your message uh, on Instagram, and I was like, "Oh my god, what's going on?" <laughs> Which is amazing. Uh, because you trolled the president of the United States. So how did you, how did this come about and how is the lint on your carpet now? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I didn't quite get to organize all of it. Uh, I think around the time that his New York rally is happening is when my schedule is freed next to actually continue to do it. Um, But I accidentally bought tickets for that too. (laughs) because <laughs> they were free again so what? Why not? just in case right um they never learn <laughs> no but i uh i saw online somebody was like you know trump's like selling his rally tickets for free i like is he that worried that nobody's gonna show up and i was like that is so funny if that <laughs> happened I would go, I would lose my mind. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll make like a TikTok about it. I don't know. I'll see. I went through the website and I saw how easy it was. I used a fake name, fake email. I used my phone number so I could get the verification code. And I was just like, this is wild how easy it is. They asked for my zip code. So I Googled like Tulsa, (laughs) Oklahoma zip codes. And I was like, wow, there we go. Now they, they know that I'm there. And uh, I was just like, this is so funny. Imagine if it was empty because I didn't know it was unlimited tickets he was selling. And so I just posted on TikTok. I was like, whatever. My good ones get like 2,000 at most likes. And so I didn't really think I was going to get much of it. And then after like a day, I had gotten around 2,000, 3,000. And I was like, okay, (laughs) that's a little quick. After two days, I had 20,000 likes on it. And I had so, yeah, it was insane the amount of comments. And I, like I had said the thing, I was like, oh, I totally forgot that I have to sort the lint from my carpet by size. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And so then people were in the comments. It was so funny. They were like, oh my God, I just bought it, but I forgot I have to water my fish. That was probably (laughs) one of the funniest ones that I read. And it was like, it was so crazy and, and everyone was sharing it and they were all commenting on it for the algorithm so that everyone would see it. Um, and of course, because of that, I got a lot of hate from Trump supporters. Um, saw that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot, but honestly, it's kind of funny how offended they get over something so small like that. Cause literally my only, the only intent that really drove me to do that is just like, Imagine how funny it would be if it was just empty. Like that would just kind of, that that would just like kind of embarrass him. Make him like a little bit mad. Um, And so, oh my God. And he was so mad. I showed my manager on like the 18th. So that was two days before the rally. And I just, I was like, this is blowing up. And I just want to show you because this is so funny. And she thought it was the funniest thing ever. And she's like, you have to tell me that this is going to work. And, uh, and it did, I got home from work on the 20th and somebody sent me a tweet and it had my video linked in it. And they were using my video to explain why the rally was empty. And I was like, this is, 
blowing my mind that did not happen. I was going through all the photos and it was so empty. And all I could think of was like, I did that. I was a part of that. And I embarrassed the hell out of him. It's absolutely every, I like if you do a Google search for you or TikTok or Tulsa and you're there, NBC and all these other uh, interviews, I guess you did with other, with other uh, outlets. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it did blow up (laughs) in Trump's face, which is in a spectacular fashion. Yeah, I, uh, I did. did. (laughs) What's that Turpin? The power of you. Yeah. And that's what, that's what a lot of people don't understand is like Gen Z right now, we are the future. Like, what is it? We have five years in Gen Z that can vote, I think it is, or more. And it's, it's insane how, how much of an impact that we have. Cause when I was growing up, I always heard like, you're the future. The youth is like the new generation. And it was like, okay, but you guys aren't going to listen until I'm an adult anyways. And all of a sudden, like, I, I, I did this and everyone listened and everyone jumped on it and it made a difference. And it kind of made me really understand the impact of teenagers. It's, of course. And like, I, I'm willing to admit that I'm 34 years old in the grand scheme of the world. That is not that old. I, I don't know how to tick tock. That's okay. (laughs) Like, I I, I like to think that I'm at the cutting edge of of, um, technology and I can do everything and I can solve that problem. I don't know how to TikTok. I've never tried. And and that tells me that there's a a really equipped generation coming up behind me that's going to take over the world. And rightly so. 100%. Gen Z, we've we've got it in the bag. (laughs) Like... There, it's just like if you talk to anyone who's in Gen Z and you're like, if you tried to speak up on something when you were younger, when you were in high school or for some people like right now, what would your what would your mom say to you? And most of them would probably be like, you're just a kid, because that's what I heard. It was always just you're just a kid. Aww. Aww. This, one, <laughs> this one's going to change the world, too. Yeah, you're Are gonna you make shy? a TikTok and embarrass the next president in the United States. Done. Done. <laughs> Hopefully, there isn't another Trump, but you know, we'll see. Who have you got? Who's in your hand? Toy it's, Story. It's Wheezy. Wheezy. Is that your Wheezy? Right. You want to go play? <laughs> She's so shy. Oh. <laughs> She like she like wants to come and see what I'm doing, but then at the same time she doesn't want to. Uh, she this is like the reality of working from home and doing interviews yeah. from home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sorry oh, for that appearance, but she yeah. she just came up to me and she's looking at my computer like, "What are you doing, Dad? What are you doing, Dad?" <laughs> Had to show her. Sorry. Continue. That's okay. Um, she's no, talking about did, Zoomers. Yeah, Zoomers. I did. Uh, I did a podcast last week. Um, about my activism as well. And one of them was 32 and the other one was like 37. And both of them were just like, we're near the end of the millennials. Um, and we have no idea what TikTok is. Uh, K-pop stands also helped to take over and do this. The word got out to them and they were just, they were on it. And I had to look guys, up what a stan was. Yeah. These guys were like, I don't know what a stan is. And I had to tell them like the history of the word because it's, it's from an Eminem song. Yeah. I looked it up. I looked up. Oh, the, uh, okay. I, I looked up the history of the I word. I get it now. Well, yeah. yeah. Do you know the song I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, where the word came from. So I it's, it's about a, okay. a fan base that's willing to do like anything because yeah, they, like, there's crazed fan. such crazy that's fans. Fan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's easy home. to collect an army nowadays, an online army. Oh my God. <laughs> no, I mean, I you, there's so many tools nowadays at your disposal at your disposal in terms of uh, activism, um, and I think you're in a unique time period when you know there's just so much that you can do. Or if you're a creative and you wanted to share something, like like who could imagine 
like people uh, becoming popular on a video sharing platform and then getting a record contract and, and that kind of thing happening, right? Is, isn't that how Justin Bieber became famous? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... I'm very fortunate to have grown up right when the internet was introduced. So I kind of grew up with it and I grew up with technology and as it expanded, I expanded with it. So I never had to deal with like, I don't know how to work this. Cause I just, I, I grew up with it and as things changed, I changed too. And, and um, it's amazing because now I have all of these things available to me. Like I have, there, there's so many, there's like billions of people on TikTok and mine reached over a million people. And, and I had NBC reach out to me asking to use my video on their newscast. I had Teen Vogue ask me to do an interview. Mm. And it's, it's like, there's so much stuff available to me that I, I can use my voice for good. And this is going back to the white privilege conversation. It's a way that I can use my white privilege to lift up people of color and, and talk about what's going on because like, let's face it, racist people will listen to a white person. They'll listen to a white woman before they listen to a man of color. And if I can make that one person listen and realize, then I've done something good with my life. What do you intend to do? Um, like, I know you're acting right now, you're modeling. Do you, do you see yourself in the future um, going into politics or becoming a professional activist, whatever that means? Um, or do you do you see this kind of feeling of um, working for social social justice uh, becoming part of a bigger part of what you do every day? One hundred percent. I don't see myself getting into politics necessarily, but I will never stop activism. I consider myself a radical activist. I. I will fight and scream and ride in the street. You know what? If a ri- I going to those protests downtown, I would like message my friends. And I'm like, listen, if a riot's happening, I get. I guess I'm a part of it. I don't care because I'm a part of that change that's happening. People mm-hmm. listen once you get loud and once you get angry. And I am a loud and angry person, <laughs> so I, I'm definitely going to get more into activism, and I'm gonna. I'm going to start seeing what I can do. And as things start opening up again, and it's better for us to go out and do this, I'm going to do it a whole lot more. Um, So politics, not necessarily, but activism, I'm definitely, I'm always going to expand and I'm always going to keep doing it because I, a lot of people see activism and they think, they, they think negatively of it. They think like, oh, that's just somebody who's going to protest and be mad about everything. And some people see me angry and they're like, oh, it's just a over emotional woman who just wants to scream at men. And it's like, no, <laughs> I'm never going to stop. I'm going to keep going until something happens that I don't need to anymore. And that something is going to be like, Canada changing its ways so that everyone is equal. That's going to be my family members understanding that, that people of color are just as important as people who are white. And, and it's going to be, uh, the equality of sexes, genders, races, everything. Like that's, that is the only time I will stop activism is when it's not needed anymore. And then what will you do? celebrate <laughs> I don't I do know believe, I do believe that uh, we, we need people like you who will fight ferociously on on the one side in order to make things change because you can't always like as much as people hate change and human beings don't like change at all um, we work against it we always try to go back to our own comfortable little bubble um, but in, in order to actually make change happen, sometimes you definitely 
need a revolution as opposed to an evolution because only so much can change if you expect it to just to just to happen of course like a prime example of that is in the states uh there was the college football player who protested by taking a knee during the anthem Kaepernick. and so yeah and then everyone started doing it and just the racist got so mad because it was disrespecting the anthem and it was like okay you disrespect human lives every day I don't understand how kneeling in the middle of a song is like worse than that. And that was a way of doing our peaceful protesting and our, our, our more silent ways of protesting and nobody listened and nobody took us seriously. We had, uh, there's just so many different examples of, of peaceful protesting for Black Lives Matter that nobody cared to listen to, that it pushed us to these riots. It pushed us to burning the buildings down. It took us burning the precinct down in yeah. Minneapolis. Like That's when people started listening was when we got angry and when it, it got vicious and this and that. And it's just like, sometimes that's what it takes. Oh, it, it, to me, it was so hypocritical when uh, when Trump made the, the comment and said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And, and people were saying, no one's going to listen to your cause because you're being violent about it. Like, if you protest peacefully, we'll listen. It's like, what have we been doing for exactly. you know, half, over half of a century? Like, <laughs> it's exactly. And I... I posted a big thing on Facebook and I was like, here are examples of peaceful protesting. So if you're mad about the riots, what were you doing during this? Cause I know I was cheering them on. I was all for it always. And I, I was they, always so for the kneeling during the anthem. I think that was such a great way of, yes. of taking a, taking a stand by taking a knee. It was just like such a great, a great thing to do. Right. Like what, what a way of getting your message across. Yeah, but um, I, I had a Trump supporter find my Facebook because I had two posts that were public so that people could share it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they commented on both of them saying they were going to find mm-hmm. where I lived and they were going to burn my house down. Good luck, the border's closed. Yeah, so, uh, see, see you tomorrow. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll meet you at the airport. Yeah. So what do you say, like some people aren't... Um, activists they they aren't going to go out there and start a riot or go to the extent um that other people would in terms of the extremes of burning things or that kind of thing what do you what would you like to see people become more active doing if if not to start a protest and and that kind of thing yeah, well, you don't need to go out and you don't need to riot and protest to be an activist because there's some people who just aren't comfortable doing that. And that's totally fine. Um, like, and going back to in high school with the Thanksgiving thing, that was activism. When I was fighting for us to, because they stole a charity for us, I, I, was, I was trying to get it back. I was trying to actively get change and the only way that I could do it as what was I like 14 like a 14 year old girl all I could do was go online and tweet them and and call them and so there's these ways of doing activism that you don't have to be there in person and I think that through this pandemic as a lot of people are finding different ways to do that as well and now we've realized how much is available to us on the internet um, and you can do your activism online as long as you're fighting for a change. It's activism. You don't need to be in the streets. The cool thing nowadays is that there's so many, everybody's got a camera on them. Mm-hmm. Everybody has their eye on things that are going on around them. and to which, keep, which can be negative too. Like it's, which can be it, negative, but it's I mean. It's getting a little bit Orwellian, but. When yeah. stuff happens that is, um, not just then it's good to have people take notice but take the next step and report it or take the next step and stand up for that person yeah and a big thing is like with that film um filming comment is there's there was a question um 
that keeps getting asked time and time again how many weren't filmed. We, we would have never known about George Floyd if it did not get filmed. And, and it's just so insane how much the cops try and hide. And I, like, the death of Elijah in the States again, watching that video, they, the police, I get so, I'm so, like, emotional over that death because it was so brutal and heartbreaking. But the police, they took their cameras off of their bodies and they put it on the ground and you can hear in the background. It's in the audio. Yeah. One Mm -hmm. of them is like your camera's facing here. And it's like, if you're worried about the camera filming something, maybe you're doing something wrong. There were videos during a protest where the cops dragged a um, black protester behind a statue and started brutally beating the devil out of him. And they looked around to see if anyone was filming and they didn't catch the one person who was. Like, as as harmful, sure, as filming can be, it's so important that we understand the power of our cameras mm-hmm. and that we as an individual have by just having that on us. There are so many police officers who got fired because they were, they were filmed. Mm-hmm. That's disgusting. Mm-hmm. But, like, not just film, but do something with that film, right? Share it or, like, do something while you're there, too. Exactly. And that's, that's another thing, too, is, like, for, for George Floyd's case, what do you do when three police officers are holding one unarmed black man down, killing him? What do you do? Those police are obviously trigger-hungry. You know, if... If I was there in that position, I because I'm white, I would I'd feel okay jumping in, but if I was a person of color there, I would understand not feeling safe going and doing anything because they, like I could be next. That is a that is a tough question. What would you do? And you wouldn't you I guess you wouldn't know unless that actually happened. I think it's, you wouldn't it's know. It's the fight or flight and thinking like in the moment yeah. What would I be able to do? Because to be completely honest, I'd probably be in shock for a bit until I process what's happening. And then a lot of screaming would go on. Mm-hmm. I'd probably get arrested for what mm-hmm. I would do. Um, but then, you know, like, but it's, it's so, you're watching a person being killed. What do you do? Yeah. yeah. I guess that was too heavy of a question. <laughs> no, it's a it's a good question because I've always I've often asked myself these questions in terms of scenarios. But mm-hmm. I think I think until you're in that moment, you don't know how you're going to respond. I mean, no, you're, you can prepare yourself, but you but don't how know. how do you prepare yourself too? Like I I can no. tell myself before I go. All right. If I see an unarmed person of color being racially profiled by the police and then it gets physical, I'm going to jump in there, I'm going to film it, and I'm going to yell at the cop and this and that, but then it'll actually happen. And it's 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 scary. It's going to be so scary that it's like, I don't know what to do. And, and I don't know what's going to happen to me health-wise. I don't know if this cop is trigger-hungry. I, like there's just no way to really prepare yourself for that moment. Can you talk a little bit about um, defunding the police? Um, Because you mentioned uh, eradicating the RCMP. Um, Did you actually mean like no policing at all? Or was this, was there something else that you're talking about? Um, I, I am 100% 1312 ACAB police The police force was built on racism. When slaves were freed, the white people felt scared that the the free um, black community were going to come back and hurt them. So they created a police force to protect the white people. So just just the police force in general, it's it's history is literally like it's just racism and it's it's hurtful. And so what I want is 
I want to be completely honest with you. I don't want police. I want to abolish the police. And when people see abolish the police, they think, oh, there's going to be crime running through the streets. This and that, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's because you grew up thinking the police are good. I grew up seeing how awful the police are. There was a wellness check a couple weeks ago with a woman of color here in the Metro Vancouver area. And because her boyfriend was worried that she's going to do something. So the police showed up and they dragged her down the hall, kicked her head into the ground so many times. They pulled her by her hair. That was the police who's supposed to be protecting us. By abolishing the police, I don't mean just completely get rid of people who are going to help us. I mean, putting in place the resources that we need. Mm -hmm. We need healthcare professionals who are going to go and do these wellness checks, who are actually going to help protect these people who need it. Mm -hmm. I mean, child care workers going in and helping in, in abusive situations who know how to diffuse the situation and can take the kid and put it in a safe place instead of the police just arresting the dad and then you know releasing them the next right don't don't send the people with the guns into every situation exactly Mm -hmm. and there's another thing with that is it's gonna be affecting the prison system as well and i think that the prison system needs to change and any drug related crime they should be in a rehabilitation center Mm -hmm. well i mean there's there's a lot that can be said about why are there people still in jail for marijuana crimes when that is it's now legal. legal. Yeah. Um, and, and the argument can be made. It wasn't legal at the time. So they were, they're still guilty of a criminal act that was criminal at the time. Okay. Well that, that opens up another can of worms, but, but that's uh, when you do a retrial or, or you reevaluate what's important in your society. Exactly. Um, like- is it so important to get this person off the street because they were smoking a joint? Yeah. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Kung that you, you don't want to send the person ill-equipped with a, an itchy trigger finger to a situation they ought not go to. But do we still need to have some kind of law enforcement of for, for people that are going to be committing local acts of terror for the for the the people that beat their spouses and yes and, and, and 100%. rob banks and it's like, just not the police it's what, it's, what a would it be new, it's a new law system that comes into place and the thing with abolishing the police is it's not overnight and that we just immediately put this stuff into place it's slowly over time it's it's defunding them and redistributing their um the finances into other places um one thing that I always say is, you know, the VPD, their yearly budget this year is over $310 million. And the reasoning is because of Black Lives Matter protests might turn into a riot. That is the reasoning. $310 million because a riot that will not start might happen. When I went to school where I had to pay for all of my supplies on myself, because the teachers didn't, you know, you guys aren't going to buy my supplies for me. You don't have the funds for that. There was a lot of stuff that I had to supply for myself in schools, elementary and high school. Like, and I don't come from a wealthy family either. And defunding the police is how you start with the abolishing. It's, it's redistributing that money and then it's putting into place the healthcare workers and slowly Rela- like taking away some responsibilities from them. And then it's building a new system with new training, uh, new uh, beliefs on how to run it, all that kind of stuff until the system is at a point where we can get rid of the police and now put this into place. It's not just putting something in one day and then all this crime's going to happen because nobody's ready. It's a slow build. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of people think that when we say abolish the police, we're like, let the crime run in the streets. It's like, no, we want, we're, we're making it better because so much crime happens from police. Indigenous women are constantly being kidnapped, murdered, taken advantage of, and the police do not care. Mm-hmm. 
And if we abolish that and we put in a proper system, then they will care. They'll open the investigation on the highway of tears. They'll find what's happening and they're going to make things right. That's what abolishing the police is. Hmm. So it's really about specialization for situations that, you know, I mean, people keep call, um, calling it wellness checks and it doesn't seem to be going well. No. <laughs> for anybody. Um, to just send the police just off the bat for whatever it is, it's, you need to figure out what the situation is before you send the guy with the gun, right? Exactly. And you need some sort of different way of structuring how situations are taken care of because sometimes you do need somebody who's a counselor or somebody who can talk somebody down mm -hmm. and not the person who's trained to do that aggressively. Yeah. Some, some are, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily trying, trying to come to defense of a, of a system that needs improvement, but again, to play devil's advocate, there are several who do go through uh, counseling training and grief counseling training and all this kind of stuff, but it's, it's not universal. It's not something that everybody gets. And, and to go on top of that, it's not mandatory yeah, for yeah, police to go yeah. through that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, Mr. Kim has a friend who's a, a VPD actually. And I mean, he's basically said the same thing about going to situations where he, he's not trained to deal with. Like, why are you sending me here? Mm -hmm. There's, there are things that he could be taking care of that this is now taking time away from. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and the thing, um, going back onto the wellness checks, that woman who is dragged by her hair and kicked in her face by a police officer, she's a nursing student, and she did an interview, and she had said, she's like, as a nurse, part of my schooling is conflict resolution. And because if, if nurse, the thing is... <laughs> I'm sorry. There's just so many like thoughts running through my head and I get, I get very like heated talking about stuff like this. Cause it's, I'm just so passionate about it, but it's just police. You can make that argument of like, Oh, not all cops are bad, but it's still, if you had to go into an emergency surgery, like it was life or death and you were in the emergency room. If somebody went up to you and went, there's about a 50, 50% chance this, doctor will just kill you on the table because he doesn't care or he could save your life how does that make you feel mm -hmm. right and that's the whole thing of like sure not all cops are bad but it's the bad ones that ruin the police force and ruin the name i'm not i'm not going to call the cops because they could there's a 50 50 chance they could send me a bad one that wants to just kill every person of color they see mm -hmm. same thing with firefighters if your house is on fire and you call a, the fire department, there's a 50, what if there was a 50, 50% 50 chance that, oh, they could just like let it burn. And then once your house is completely charred and just dust on the ground, then they'll put it out. Or they could just put it out immediately and go in and like save your kids who are in there and, and mm -hmm. all your stuff. Like you don't make those excuses for other frontline workers. So what's mm -hmm. different with the police? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to play devil's advocate, I mean, it's like I, I do know a couple of cops who I don't think are not are, you know, racist or anything like that. But they're put in situations sometimes where they their lives are in danger. Um, and so when you send them out to to these things where they don't know exactly what's going on, they're humans as well. Right. They're going to be on the alert hopefully their training will come in handy but it's just like the situation where we're talking about if we saw someone getting murdered what would you do you don't know until you're faced with that situation what you're going to do mm -hmm. right um you might react differently from what you're trained mm -hmm. so again it's it's like we have put them into a situation like where they have to react quickly and there could be somebody who, who ends up shooting them or, you know, they might not come home to their, their kids that night. So there is that in the back of their mind. Um, but again, you know, why are they attending to a situation which they shouldn't be attending to if there's no immediate danger? Right. And it all comes down to the training mm -hmm. and 
my acting program in college is longer than the training program for police before they can handle a gun. Hmm. Think about that. That's that's so that you can play a cop on TV. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like nursing students, they have to go through like minimum, what, four to eight years. Some of them do 12 before mm-hmm. they can even go and work in a hospital as a nurse or a doctor. It depends like on cops, the field, but yes, yeah. Cops get six months, eight months. Like to be a licensed hairstylist, you have to have uh, at least, I think it's a year of training, like a, a certain amount of hours. Whereas the police training, it's like equivalent to three months. It, it's kind of interesting though that you say that. And I, and I don't think you're wrong, but one of the things, and I'm sure that Mr. Kung would agree with me that I noticed going through teacher training, which required a bachelor's degree before you could even apply for it. So that's four years minimum. And then you apply for a teacher's college, which was a 12 month program. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to slag my, my alma mater here, but I think a lot of teacher candidates would agree. You actually learn more from doing the job than anybody could ever teach you about the job in a professional training program. Um, and uh, it's so tricky because you're right. In, in, in so many situations, being a police officer can and, and will be a life and death situation. Being a teacher isn't quite life and death, but I know that I'm a better teacher now than I was when I started. And I know that when I started, I wasn't very good because I didn't have a lot of experience on the job and the, the kind of classroom theory stuff that you get in a, in a professional teaching program doesn't really at all prepare you for what it's like to be in a room with at least 28 sets of eyes looking at you. And it's, again, it's different, right? It, it all comes down to proper training. Like, I understand that what the police do um, or, or what they're supposed to do is important. And it, it's, it's, it's to help society and, and this and that. But it all comes down to their training again. Yes, they have to take these criminals off the streets. Yes, they're put into these stressful situations where it's like they have a split second to think. And they have no longer than that. But again, it comes down to their training. They, they barely get any training. They should be put into like certain um, scenario type of acting kind of training where, where you, you're thrown into that scenario and it's like, what do you do? So they are prepared. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it just like, that's, it, that's the argument that I can always make to rebuttal anything that you guys say about the police is like, well, they have to do this, you know, isn't that stressful? It's like, okay, but do they have the proper training for that? Mm-hmm. Obviously not if they don't know what to do. And also the right screening for the right people. I think like in, in so many situations you, you had like, even in the George Floyd incident, you had cops just following this lead cop who was doing obviously the wrong thing mm-hmm. and all they did was follow along. Right. Um, and, and you need to have like that, the guy who killed George Floyd, how many things did he have on his record? Like, why was he still there? Oh, yeah. It's just astounding. Right. It was, it, it had all gone back to like 2008 or even earlier. It was, it's disgusting to think about. Um, I have it somewhere on my phone. I'm just trying to look for it right now, but it's like, Oh, like his rap sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I saved it as soon as I saw it. Here it is. So Derek Chauvin's his name, the officer who did kill George Floyd um, in 2006 is his earliest, like recorded um, one that is public. And that was, he was one of like multiple officers who murdered a unarmed Latino man in 2008. He shot and killed an unarmed black man in 2011, 2011, he shot and killed an unarmed native man. And he has 12 known police brutality cases against him. 12 known. 
how many of that, like how many cases did they cover up? There's so many cases that people went to the, um, that specific police departments, um, like records and they, they covered everything up and it's, I can't trust a police force if that's what they're doing, if that's who they're choosing to protect. Is a man who continuously murders people of color, I cannot trust a police force who trusts that. Well, I'm sure there were there are some good cops on that force, but even if there are good cops, if they're working within a system that is bad, they quit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then bad things will happen. Well, I mean, Again, not not to immediately turn this back around to to Mr. Kung and I, and certainly not to throw any of our colleagues under the bus. But it, you do get it in every profession where there are going to be some people that are are in it for the wrong reasons, and those people don't do the job as well, and and it shows. And you know, um, I think Chris Rock came out and and said something very similar to what you already said, Alicia, where he said. There are there are some jobs where you just don't want to have a bad egg. Like you can't just say, "Oh, there are a few bad eggs." Well, think about it being an airline pilot. Yeah, American Airlines has a few bad eggs. They just really don't like landing planes on the runway. Like mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't be satisfied with that. Um, but but so it's a system that needs to get better at finding those bad eggs and and weeding them out of the profession uh, being a police officer is is a, a profession that can be very noble there are many police officers that do save lives but because of and, and i hate to say this because this is making a, a broad generalization unfortunately it's true in a lot of cases it is a job that carries a gun and because of that for some people that have anger management and aggression issues all of a sudden, that becomes very attractive. Ooh, a job where I get to carry a gun. And if that's the reason why you're going into that profession, you shouldn't be going into that profession. But but there are a lot of people that have a lot of aggression issues, and going and being a police officer sounds like the right job because they have an opportunity to exercise their aggression. It's like, no, no, that's not the point. You want compassionate people to be police officers, just like you want compassionate people to be teachers. Um, you know, if, if you have anger management issues and, and you want to, to have a job that you can be angry at, I don't know. I don't know what job's for you, but it's not being a police officer. Go to anger management. Like, well, yeah, get, get help, but I don't know, like d- dig ditches. Like if you want to really get, into, you, you know, um, cut, cut, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say cut boxing. Trees. <laughs> yeah, sure yeah become an mma fighter Get like i i from. have friends who had uh anger management issues and they took up boxing and that's how they get their aggression out mm-hmm. um but kind of going back to the police and everything i personally i have never had a bad experience with a cop i have only i i've had three three personal experiences with a police officer and every single one of them, it was, it, it was good. You know, they were doing their job right. They were respectful people. And so I, I know that there are good people. And mm. I still, like, mm. it's because I see what's going on in the world. And I'm not, I'm not allowing myself the mm. privilege to filter it out. Because yeah. I am very privileged to be a white woman in Canada to just be like, well, I don't want to, I don't really want to see that. I'm just going to turn my phone over, whatever. Mm-hmm. I like, I understand that privilege and I realize that I have it and I still educate myself on what's happening. Mm-hmm. How, how do you not let all of the stuff that's happening, especially during a pandemic, weigh you down so much that you're just overwhelmed? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes oh, even... so I, depressing. Well, sometimes mm-hmm. like people send me stuff about COVID and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, this is all stuff I need to know. But sometimes it does feel very overwhelming to me when I'm trying to get through what we're going through right now. Uh, so how, do, how yeah. do you deal with it? So Sometimes Mr. Turpin will send Mr. Kung a text message and he'll immediately <laughs> reply, stop sending this. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
It, well, a, a huge part of activism, like I mentioned um, earlier, is the hardships that you face and understanding. Um, oh, she's, she's so cute. She's not so shy anymore. Now she's like trying to get in the camera. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but what I was saying is um, a huge part of activism is the hard the hardships that you have to face. And it is hard. It's activism is a battle that you're constantly fighting. And when things get hard, you, you do get upset and you can get discouraged. Um, but it's the understanding of look at how far I've come. Look at all that that has, has been accomplished because we all stood up and we all did this. It is so hard to like stay focused. <laughs> she's in she's the putting a baby at the camera, a bald baby. That is a freaky looking baby, actually. Oh, that's I not even like her freaky one. I was trying not to look, but it was getting closer and closer. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? This um, is a COVID interview. That's what yeah. Happened. This is, I'm sorry. I'm a dad in a two bedroom condo. This is going to happen. <laughs> the, the other one is right at my feet right now too. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a lot of like, you just got to look back and see all the stuff you accomplished and understand like I have, I've, I've fought yeah. battles. I've Fuck gone me. through other hardships, I, this and that. And, and I can get through this one too. Cause there's been a lot of times where I'm like, there's so much going on and I don't know if, if anything's going to change. And I would get into these depressions where I'm just like, nothing's going to get better and, and not enough people are fighting and this and that. And then it's just, you know, I'll, I'll go online and I'll look at videos of the protests and it's to me, protests and the riot videos, they were very empowering and inspiring mm -hmm. in kind of a weird way. And understanding all the stuff that we've accomplished through these protests, it's it's a way to keep me uplifted and to push me to keep going. Because if this is how much I accomplished during this time, imagine how much more I'm going to accomplish once I, I just get through this, this, this obstacle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess the scary part is not being able to see the things that you want to see happen, but it is encouraging to see all those people out there right now um, that also believe the same things. Right. Yeah. And um, especially with like the black lives matter movement, specifically the, the Brenoa Taylor law that was passed where you can't do um, a, like a, a search of somebody's house without a warrant. Um, that. It, it, that was an important thing to be passed, but now that it's passed, the officers who broke into her house, the wrong house, by the way, and shot her and killed her while she was asleep and then arrested her boyfriend for defending himself with his gun that he had the right to own and he didn't even have his finger on the trigger. He just had it out in case he had to use it and he got arrested and Bernoa Taylor, who was asleep, got murdered. And that's an obstacle right now that it's like, it, it's, it just blows my mind. You can pass this bill, but see, be so blind to why you passed it. And, and it's a hardship that, that constantly discourages me because it's like, is this going to get better? And then you just think back to all of George Floyd's murderers got charged because we fought so hard and and this bill got passed because we fought so hard and and the seattle pd got defunded um 50 of their annual budget because we fought so hard and if we just keep fighting then we can we can win this one too that's great i'm glad you have the hope and but it, it helps to see things actually happening now yeah so any uh, last words of advice for anybody out there who's listening right now, who's kind of on the edge of their seat, seeing all this stuff happening, not knowing what to do, uh, being in the middle of a, a pandemic and, you know, feeling the effects of that as well? Um, honestly, it's just understand that the youth is the future. And by silencing us, because 
you don't think that we're educated enough is harmful. And we're able to make a change. And we have been making a change. And the youth are the future. And you just shouldn't be scared to stand up and fight for what is right. Awesome. And also normalizing, understanding when you're wrong and asking questions to fix your internalized toxic traits. Mm-hmm. And educate yourself about what's going on. Don't just believe anything anybody tells you. Exactly. Terrific, Alicia. I'm glad we had this talk. Yeah. And keep keep on going because we need people like you. And uh and stay safe during this whole thing. Turpin, you're muted if you're trying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I muted myself when Kyla was on my lap. Um, no, I was going to say thank you. This has been very educational um, for me too. Like just just to hear everything you say, and, and I've learned lots in this conversation. So that's what we need to keep doing. We need to keep learning. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Bye.